Good morning. Good morning. I welcome you to worship here at United Lutheran Church. Welcome to guests of worship. We're glad to have you with us this morning. We welcome those who join us through our radio broadcast each week and those who are joining us through Facebook Live. Just a couple of announcements uh, before we begin. Uh, you'll note on page six of your bulletin that next Sunday at United Lutheran, we have a bread auction that's taking place following worship in our fellowship hall. Uh, so we hope people will be generous in bringing uh, breads to auction off and people will be generous in bidding because uh, we're, the, the funds that are received will go to Lutheran disaster response uh, to the Ukraine situation in the Ukraine. Uh, also next Sunday is Palm Sunday. It's the beginning of Holy Week and our Holy Week schedule is listed there for you uh, in our bulletin and you'll note that on Monday, Thursday is First Communion for some of our youth as well. As a part of Holy Week, we usually have readers for our different services. We are still in need of readers for our Good Friday service, our 7 p.m. service, and if you would contact uh, Pastor Carla or myself following worship or in the, this week so we can uh, get you uh, the readings and you can uh, find out how to help out. Uh, also this coming Wednesday, we have our midweek Lenten service. Uh, and uh, we've been talking about our vocabulary of faith. And so we've been taking a word each week. Uh, this week the word is love, and we've had speakers, and our speakers this week are Robert and Ruth Turner, and so you want, won't want to miss uh, how they share uh, the story of love in their lives. It is the fifth Sunday in the season of Lent, and our theme has been full to the brim, and so we uh, have been full to the brim with God's gift of love for us, and that overflows into our lives and the lives of other people. I would invite you now to turn in your bulletins to our front cover to our order for confession and forgiveness, and would you please rise as you are able. Holy One, we confess that we have wandered far from you. We have not trusted your promises. We have ignored your prophets in our own day. We have squandered our inheritance of grace. We have failed to recognize you in our midst. Have mercy on us. Forgive us and turn us again to you. Teach us to follow in your ways. Assure us again of your love and help us to love our neighbor. Amen. Beloved in Christ, the word not draws near to you, and all who call out to God shall be saved. In Jesus, God comes to you again and again and gathers you under wings of love. In Jesus' name, your sins are forgiven. God journeys with you and teaches you how to live in love. Amen. Amen. Our opening hymn is number 339 in your red hymnals.
The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And let us join together in our period. Let us join together in our prayer of the day. Creator God, you prepare a new way in the wilderness, and your grace waters our desert. Open our hearts to be transformed by the new thing you are doing, that our lives may proclaim the extravagance of your love, given to all through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated.
The first reading is from Isaiah chapter 43, verses 16 through 21. Thus says the Lord who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise, they are extinguished, extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches. For I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself, so that they, may, they might declare my praise. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The psalm is Psalm 126. Please read responsively. When the Lord restored the fortunes of Zion, then we were like those who dream. Then was our mouth filled with laughter, and our tongue with shouts of joy. And they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad indeed. Restore our fortunes, O Lord, like the water courses of the naked. Those who sowed with tears will reap the song, the, with songs of joy. Those who go out weeping, carrying the seed, will come again with joy, shouldering their sheaves. The second reading is from Philippians chapter 3, verses 4b through 14. <clears throat> Paul writes, If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as a loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. child worshiping with us today of any age, you are welcome to come up for the children's sermon. unusual question for you all today. Are you ready for it? What does love smell like? Interesting. Jonah, what do you think? Very good. A very good scent. Okay. Anyone else? Maybe to you even. Yeah? I think that that's a really tough question. I'm wondering if you've ever stepped into your grandparents' house and you smell like the scent that only your grandparents' house smells like. Or if you've hugged someone that you love and you felt comforted and like you know like they have a scent too, right? Or some might say that flowers remind them 
of love, the smell of fresh flowers or roses, maybe the smell of your favorite meal, spaghetti, right? Or um, your favorite stuffed animal that you sleep with every night. When I smell it, the smell of the smoke of a campfire, I, I remember my memories of sitting around with the Bible camp counselors, and I remember, like, I feel love and feel loved from that. So there's just some smells that remind us of love, and they're different for everyone, right? It smells of people, smells of places, smells of things. And in today's Bible story, we hear about a friend of Jesus named Mary um, showing love to Jesus. And we just read this story, so hopefully it's just a re recall. But it begins with friends sitting around a table having dinner. We have Jesus, we have Mary, Martha, Lazarus, Judas, a group of friends eating together. And all of a sudden, Mary walks over and picks up a jar of expensive perfume. Do you remember this? And next, she walks over to Jesus and she begins pouring this expensive perfume on Jesus' feet, right? And, and one more thing that she did, she let down her hair and then wiped Jesus' feet with her hair. Now, this seems a little bit odd. Why do you think that Mary did this in the middle of the dinner party? I think that is bingo, bango, bungo. Jonah said maybe she's showing that she loves Jesus. I think that you're right. I think that by giving her most precious item that she had, she was showing Jesus love, her deep love for Jesus. She was showing respect and giving a gift. And so that night, the whole room smelled like um, perfume, this beautiful fragrance, and that's what love smelled like. So you can come and smell this. I have a special fragrance here if you want. So maybe the room smelled like this. This is lavender. Maybe not. Okay. So Mary doesn't just say, I love you to Jesus. Her love is an action. So I wonder today, what actions do we do that show love to others around us? Yes, when we give someone a hug or a kiss, that's showing love. Yeah, giving of our time with a person, that's showing that we love them. Um, maybe giving someone a gift or, or helping someone with their yard work or showing up for a service project at church. Charlotte gave Frida a gift, her friend. So I think that one great way that United Lutheran gives or shows love to our neighbors is preparing meals. And we give meals to people in our congregation, and we give meals to people who live around us who are maybe hungry or in need of food. And that's one way that we're showing love to others around us. Love is an action. And one way, so our fourth and fifth graders are learning about First Communion, right, Hayden and Jonah. And one way that God shows love to us is in Holy Communion, right? So in our bread and in our wine, when we take Holy Communion, in these days it looks like this, we're reminded that God is saying, I love you, I am with you. And when we come to church and we're nourished by communion, then we can go out and be God's love in the world. And our actions can reflect God's love. And so by loving others, we are showing that we love God too. <laughs> That's a lot. Will you pray with me? You can hold your hands. You can shut your eyes. Holy God, we give you thanks for Mary and her act of love. Guide us to be like Mary and Jesus, to show love and care for others. Help us to use our words to uplift others and share your word. Be with those who are hurting, lonely, or sad. Comfort them and give them strength. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you for coming up today. Please stand for the gospel.
Holy Gospel according to John, the 12th chapter. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. There they gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, Leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. The Gospel of the Lord. And please be seated. There are times in our lives when love requires so much more than simply words. There are times when the pain and brokenness of this world calls for love that shows up with stuff. A coffee for a friend who's struggling to make it through a day. A ride to a doctor's appointment. A meal prepared for a neighbor whose grief is so deep they aren't sure how to survive it. A card with a note of encouragement for a person who is doing hard things. Yes, sometimes love needs to show up in ways we can smell and touch and taste and hold. Today's Gospel reading is about love that shows up in just such a way. Jesus is in the town of Bethany, and he's on his way to Jerusalem for the very last time, and he knows it. He stops to spend the evening with a family who are near and dear to his heart, siblings Mary and Martha and Lazarus. It was just a short time ago that Jesus had worked a miracle at their house. The sisters had sent word to Jesus that their brother was ill, but by the time that Jesus arrived, Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. And standing at the tomb of his dear friend, Jesus first wept, and then he shouted, calling Lazarus out of the tomb and restoring him to life. Not Surprisingly, that one act drew a lot of attention, and it turns out there is such a thing as bad publicity. Jesus raising Lazarus has led many to believe in Jesus, but it has also led the religious leaders to decide that there needs to be a permanent solution to the Jesus problem. Jesus was now at the top of their most wanted list. When Jesus arrives at the home of his friends, Martha, as is her habit, is doing what she's used to doing. She's serving a meal. Food, it seems, is her love language. And Lazarus, too, is at the table. He's eating and drinking, again, in the company of family and friends. And Mary seems to have left the room, but when she appears, every ounce of attention in that room becomes focused on what she is doing. She comes into the room holding a slender clay jar in her hands, and it is a container of costly perfume. A little bit of research reveals that a pound of pure nard costs about the equivalent of a year's wages. Can you imagine? And without a word, Mary kneels at Jesus' feet and she breaks the neck of that jar so that the whole room begins to smell of this perfume. 
And then she does something that no one else has ever seen before. She loosens her hair in a room full of people, including men, unheard of. She pours out this expensive perfumed ointment on Jesus' feet, and then she wipes the ointment off with her hair. This home that only a few days earlier had been filled with the stench of death is now filled in every crevice with the scent of extravagant love. Her act is so strange and so beautiful that we can't look away. What is she thinking? The Gospel writer doesn't tell the reader what's on Mary's mind or heart. We know that Mary loves Jesus and believes in him. She has watched him raise her brother from the dead, and so she's no doubt deeply grateful for him. But whatever else this is, it is undoubtedly an act of extravagant, genuine, abundant love. And Jesus' words to those in the room indicate that it is still something more. Jesus sees in Mary's act what the others in the room cannot see. She is anointing him for his burial. Have you witnessed last acts of love? When we know that our time with someone is coming to an end, we don't hold back in our expressions of love. When time is scarce, when time is limited, nothing less than extravagant, lavish love will do. Whatever else Mary thinks that she is doing, she is telling Jesus she loves him, and she holds back nothing. And in her gift, I think Jesus sees himself. Jesus, like Mary, will hold nothing back. On the cross, Jesus will pour out the whole of his life in the most impractical, excessive, extravagant display of God's love this world has ever seen. Jesus receives this gift, this love from Mary, but Judas objected to it. He complained that it was extravagant, excessive, that this could have been a better use of money, sold, the perfume sold and given to the poor. And thankfully, John tells us what a thief Judas is, because if you're anything like me, part of you agrees with Judas here. And being in agreement with Judas is not exactly the kind of company I like to keep. But the point is not that Jesus doesn't care about the poor. After all, the whole of his ministry up to this point has been about caring for those who are the least of this world. No, instead, Jesus is lifting up this moment, here and now, as the moment to love fully. Mary was seizing this moment for what it was, a moment that required extravagant love. And just a few short days later, Jesus will do something that no one has ever seen. Jesus, their teacher and Lord, will fall to his knees and wash the feet of his disciples. And no doubt, as he did so, he remembered Mary and what she had done for him as he demonstrated his, to his disciples what radical, generous, extravagant love looks like. You know, as we grow in years, most of us become quite practical. The world around us tells us that good people well, good people are sensible and disciplined and cautious. That we all need to learn the skills of adulting. And so we eat our vegetables and we start a savings account. And there's good in all of that. But we can also start to think that this is what life is all about. That getting it right and exceeding in discipline, that this is our life's goal. But Jesus calls us to so much more than this. Jesus calls us not to a life of careful discipline, but to be disciples. And Jesus is looking for disciples, for followers like Mary, who will 
give and love with everything that they've got. After all, you and I, we believe in the most impractical, outrageous, extravagant love story ever told. We believe that God loved each one of us and this world so completely that God took on human flesh and lived among us as one of us. And in his life on earth, Jesus poured out the love of God by touching the untouchable and forgiving the unforgivable and loving the unlovable. And finally, Jesus went to the cross, giving up his life so that we might know the height and the depth of God's love for this world. And what is more, not even death could stop God's love for us. Jesus is risen and intends to keep pouring out his love on this world through you and through me. So what does such extravagant love as this look like in our lives? I think it looks like realizing that many of our neighbors are food insecure, that there are children right here in our community and our neighborhood who are hungry. And so a congregation of followers of Jesus shows up for weeks every summer, serving hundreds of lovely meals and creating a space, a place not only for people to be fed, but a place of community. And I think it looks like women who gather in the fellowship hall every Tuesday, even when it's really cold, and they make beautiful quilts that bring love and hope and warmth to people they will never meet. And I think it looks like saying out loud and clearly in as many ways as we can find that the LGBTQ community who still face so many threats to their well-being in this world and in the church are deeply welcome here and needed by this community of Jesus to be exactly who they are. And I think it looks like decorating our fellowship hall with yellow and blue on Palm Sunday and baking in abundance and buying with extravagance so that the Ukrainian people, enduring the horror of war from an invading nation, know that the world has not forgotten about them and that there is help and comfort in their suffering. I think about the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus. Did the odor of death still linger in the air when Jesus arrived that day? Certainly the threat of death was hanging in the air knowing that the powerful were out now to destroy Jesus. But Mary, in an act of extravagance, filled the home with the scent of love as well. In this season of Lent, we continue to make our way through the mess and the mystery of this world. And no doubt, violence and suffering hang in the air all around us. And so we come here to be fed in ways that we can touch and taste and hear and smell. God's love shows up for us in the smell and taste of wine and bread, in water falling over the baptized, in the sound of someone's voice reading and proclaiming the word, and in the sound of someone saying your name. And fed and nourished here, we are sent into the world to show up also with love that can be seen and touched and held and smelled, filling this world that deals with death also with the scent of God's love. We are to love big, so big, in fact, that it sometimes feels strange and awkward by the standards of this world. People should start questioning our good judgment. A friend of mine who knows grief posted recently, tell the people in your life that you love them. Tell them often, make it weird. When we love big, it's going to leave us feeling vulnerable. After all, those who've shown love in this world in the most radical and expansive ways 
have often received the world's condemnation as well. May we learn today from Mary and from Jesus what it means to live in and live out of God's extravagant love, a love that fills us to the brim. When we see the body of Christ still broken in this world, may we meet it with lavish grace and pour ourselves out with extravagant love. Amen. the congregation please stand as we join in confessing our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Drawn close to the heart of God, we offer these prayers for the church, for the world, and for all those who are in need. Do a new thing in your church, O oh God. Help us to be a people of extravagant love for all, seeing the world through their eyes. Give us courage to respond where we see need around us, whether across the street or across the globe. Let us be generous in our love. God of grace, receive our prayer. Do a new thing for creation. Reverse the trajectory of climate change and environmental catastrophe. Revive habitats already impaired by human disregard. Amplify the voices of climate scientists and researchers working to chart a new course. God of grace, receive our prayer. Do a new thing, O oh Lord, in our world. Break barriers that prevent political enemies, Democrats and Republicans, from working together for the well-being of all. Make a new way for peace and collaboration among the nations. Bring an end to the war in Ukraine. Stop those who are doing evil in the name of their nation. God of grace. Do a new thing, O Lord, for those who suffer. 
reveal a path for any who are experiencing homelessness and for all who struggle with money. Comfort those who grieve and restore those who are sick. Especially this day, we pray for Nicolette Carview, Karen Searstead, Clara Beaton, Ellen Nodstead, Kevin Bloomquist, and all those we name before you in our hearts. God of grace, do no thing, O Lord, within us. Direct us into our encounters that broaden our understanding of the human experience. Amplify voices that are ignored or devalued. Deliver us especially from the scourge of hatred, hatred toward those of other races, sexual identities, and religions. God of grace, do a new thing in our death, O God. Fill us with the knowledge of Christ and the power of his resurrection as we give thanks for all the saints who now rest in you. God of grace, accept these prayers we bring, O God, on behalf of a world in need for the sake of Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And please share Christ's peace with those around you. You may be seated as we receive our offer. As the gifts are received, would you please stand as we join in singing our offering song. Extravagant God, you have blessed us with the fullness of creation. Now we gather at your feast where you offer us the food that satisfies. Take and use what we offer here. Come among us and feed us with the body and blood of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. The Lord be with you. Let us give. 
give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right and good everywhere and always to give you thanks and praise, holy God, mighty and immortal, through your Son, Jesus Christ, who calls us to return to you and live. For you are gracious and merciful, slow to anger, full of love, and faithful to your promises. And so with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered as one at the table of the Lord, we pray as Jesus has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. Come, let us share in the meal. I invite you now to take out your chalices. This is the body of Christ given for you. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. Now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in God's grace this day and always. Amen. And receive blessing. As you leave this place, may you overflow with love for those around you, and in all your living, breathing, and being, may the God of abundance fill you to the brim with God's Holy Spirit as you follow in the way of Jesus. Amen. Go in peace. Jesus meets you on the way.
Our sending hymn is number 803 in your red hymns. <laughs> 